Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and get us started, if that's okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here again this, this year to Heart Month. Uh, this year we're going to be having several different uh, distinguished speakers and physicians uh, talking about multiple different things. Tonight it's going to be a heart valve disease. Um, before I start, I'd like to first of all thank everyone here in the room for attending tonight. Um, I can tell you that when, when we look at things like medication adherence to heart transplant, we know only about 50% of those patients will stay on their regimen that'll save their life. Um, so it's individuals like everyone here in this room that really make a difference in healthcare, their own healthcare. Um, so it's individuals like you coming in here, learning about healthcare, learning about medication regimens, learning about treatment options for heart disease. So I do want to thank everyone here in this room for that. So um, before I start, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of very distinguished individuals that I have the pleasure of working with. Uh, the first individual here is Dr. Chad Carr. Dr. Chad Carr, cardiologist. He's also the director of our uh, non-invasive echocardiology department. He's going to be talking to us a lot about diagnosing and treating in a practical sense uh, heart disease. Standing next to Dr. Carr is Dr. Thomas Malloy and Dr. Malloy is a cardiothoracic surgeon and he uh, actually does some of the physical repair of the heart valve in multiple different ways. Uh, one of the things that this organization does is focus on minimally invasive and robotic heart surgery. Tom's going to be presenting some data on that. So, um, and if these two individuals aren't enough to keep you glued in your seats, we do have a raffle after. So stay in your seats, I'll be calling numbers so you have, uh, you have a potential for prizes. When we're finished, no, we yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, I didn't give these guys raffle tickets. <laughs> uh, so um, when we're all finished, I would encourage you, go ahead and stay. Uh, these guys are going to stay up here afterwards. You'll have the opportunity to come, come up, introduce yourself, ask them questions that you need, uh, anything like that. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the mic to Dr. Chad Carr. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jim. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. I, I would also like to um, sort of reiterate that the, the purpose of our, of our evening here is to kind of imagine that you're in the exam room talking with me or Dr. Malloy about a heart valve problem. And I really want it to be this kind of conversational, um, easygoing sort of thing. And, and we have some, some lovely uh, patients in the room that would, w are gonna share some of the stories. And I think that they were on the front end of this where we've had some really thoughtful conversations about, um, about this problem. And so I wanna give a brief overview of, of what valve disease means and maybe how we think about that and how that might apply to, or maybe some of you or your family, and then how we can provide some unique services here at Adventist that maybe aren't found in other places um, to deal with the problem. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and ask. All right, so moving forward. So gosh, wh what, is, what does this mean, valve disease? What are, what are we talking about? Well, as it turns out, you know, our heart is a pump and its entire job is to pump blood to the rest of the body delivering oxygen and nutrients. It's kind of a one-way thing, you know? It's got to pump in one direction, and that's the entire job of the heart, and the valves allow us to facilitate that. If any of us are mechanics or into engineering, you know, we know that one-way pumps are very important. There's actually four valves, and, and, and again, their job is to move blood smoothly through the heart. And when that does not happen, Valve disease is the reason why. Then there's two basic ideas of what valve disease is. Whoops, that's not the right way, sorry. There we are. Um, here's my little pointer here. This word stenosis, you may hear us say something like that on my chart. When you read a, a, an imaging report, it might say stenosis, and we say, what does that mean? Well, you know, when I was asked to water the lawn when I was a kid, you know, you sit there and you're like squirting the lawn and you kind of put your th thumb over the tip of it, right? And the water starts shooting through really, uh, really fast. That's a narrowing of that orifice to allow water to go through it. 
And when our valves become narrowed and strictured or obstructive, we use the word stenosis. And you can imagine that the physiologic principle is that it's harder for the heart to pump blood through that restricted valve. And people start to have trouble from that. And then there's also this word called regurgitation, which basically means the opposite, where the valve is no longer allowing blood to only move in one direction, but rather is incompetent and doesn't have a wide or tight seal, and blood sort of will leak backwards in a direction it shouldn't go. And that's another word we would use. And both of these things can happen, and they're the primary mechanisms by which valve disease occurs. Um, just to point this out, we have two uh, valves on the, on, on the right side of the heart, which are basically the tricuspid valve here and the pulmonary valve, and we have two valves on the left side of the heart called the mitral valve and the aortic valve. We'll get into more of that a little, bit a little bit later. And you might ask, well, gosh, why did this happen? What is it about valves that go bad? And, and what are the possibilities there? And, you know, as it turns out, some folks are born that way, you know? Maybe their valve was born with less tissue than normal or tissue that's more rubber band-like than others or or um, it, it's dysfunctional from the birth. Or, or perhaps, um, uh, for example, the older we get in life, sometimes there's wear and tear, scar tissue. You know, valves in a car need to be changed because of just the wear and tear on them. And our valves are the same way. They, they become corroded. Um, I like to describe that as if you can imagine, you know, the sail on a sailboat. Uh, sails are beautiful things. They're these really beautifully flexible structures but they're also, they can hold a lot of pressure. You know, the wind can push against them and they withstand that. And our valves are exactly like that. They have the ability to hold a lot of pressure, but they're also very, very flexible. And when things happen to our valves to where they can no longer be flexible, they start to not work. And that can be a corrosion of some type or even um, uh, infection or inflammation from things like lupus or other problems in that nature. Um, or if you've had something called congestive heart failure, which is something where the heart becomes enlarged, you can envision these valves stretching to a point where they no longer have the ability to function normally because they're just stretched more than they would normally do that. So that's the general concept of valve dysfunction. And gosh, what that might that cause? Well, here's, by the way, on the right, there is this little video to sort of illustrate the notion that there's valves on the right side, which is the blue side of the heart here. And that's where blood returns to the heart from the body. And then the valves on the left side where the blood is then pumped to the rest of the body there. And when those valves aren't working, you start to have symptoms. You start to feel poorly. That might exhibit itself as feeling short of breath, feeling like you can't exert yourself or exercise or do your normal activities, maybe a flight of stairs or, or what have you. Um, people can, if it gets really bad, people can faint or they can have heart-related chest discomfort or they can have worsening symptoms of things called congestive heart failure where you have fluid retention in your body and you feel short of breath or you get swelling or your abdomen swells. These are all symptoms of valve disease. And interestingly enough, by the way, some folks don't have any symptoms and yet their heart starts to become damaged and damaged and damaged until things really, really are bad. So there's quite a bit that can go on with valve dysfunction. Well, what are we talking about? I need some pictures here, people. And so here is what we call a heart ultrasound. This is this, this word echocardiogram. Basically, it means an ultrasound of the heart. And this is one of the primary ways where we actually look inside the body to look at the heart and see what's going on. And so this is the left side of the heart, and this is the right side of the heart on top. And these are two of its valves. This is the aortic valve, which allows blood to pump out of the heart and not leak backwards. And this is the mitral valve, which allows blood to return from the lungs back to the heart. And I want you to notice a few things. These are these beautiful, thin structures that are moving quite delicately, and yet they snap shut and don't let things pass them, right? And so this is, these are examples of normal functioning valves. Over on the left here, you can get a sense of what some abnormally functioning valves might look like. So again, just envision these, these really beautiful sort of normal structures here. 
And then say you had rheumatic, one had rheumatic fever when they were young, it may, might affect the opening of the valve in a certain way, or maybe a lot of wear and tear that happens throughout life. Or maybe you were born with only two leaflets instead of three. You see these are three normal leaflets here. Maybe you only have two. You know, these are different possibilities for why a valve might not work correctly. Or perhaps down here, looking at the mitral valve, this is a normal valve where it has this airtight seal. And then what if your valve is um, more uh, rubber band-like and stretchy, and so it, instead of snapping together, it starts to kind of pull away from itself. That would be this one here. Or maybe because of wear and tear, you know, the valve is held together by these parachute strings. Maybe some of that tears loose because of just wear and tear, and that valve no longer functions. So these are examples of why things might not work. Well, why is this important to me, doctor? Is this really that big of a deal? Yeah, it is. This is a common problem, and if you look at this graph here, I want to just sort of highlight the notion that um, what you're seeing is that the older you, whoops, there we are, the older you get in life, so here's 45, here's greater than 75, and these, bar, these lines represent valve problems, you can see that whether it be all valves, aortic valve, mitral valve, they all get a lot worse the older we get in life. So it's a pretty darn common problem, and it's a serious one, in the right circumstances. If we look at this, this is what we call a natural history graph. And if you can imagine this top line being people dying over time, and we all die at some point, right? It just happens, people die. And so there's a natural attrition of people over time. But once you start having really severe symptoms from like your aortic valve, people start dying very soon, within a year or two of that problem and they start having really serious symptoms. So that's a pretty significant problem, isn't it? If you have a problem and then all of a sudden 50% of people are dead in a year or maybe two, that's a big deal. And then if you treat those valve troubles, then people will have lifespans similar to what they had before the valve. So these are huge impacts we can make for people. Uh, that was dealing with the aortic valve. This graph here looks at the mitral valve, another valve that we've talked about that tends to leak. and. And, and this is even in people who don't have a lot of symptoms. And what you can identify is that the leakier this valve is over time, the worse they do. They die. They have bad heart failure. They have really bad things that make them feel really poorly <laughs> if valves are not working. So this is a significant problem that, that has consequences. So we might want to offer therapies that can be helpful to that. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, as it turns out, particularly more now than ever, Dealing with and looking into heart valve problems is a very complicated issue that requires a lot of thought and input from a lot of different people. And we really focus here at Adventist on a multidisciplinary kind of teamwork approach. And Dr. Malloy and I, we work pretty darn closely <laughs> and probably sit down three times a week and talk about patients, maybe some of you or other family members. And, and all of us work in this way. We have um, a team conference where we talk about our valve uh, issues and decide what are the best next steps and, and how do we approach the complexities and nuances. Um, we have a dedicated valve clinic, both here and also in partnership up at OHSU, but we have certainly that here, where we have um, expert kind of people talking about different aspects of treating the valves. Dr. Malloy is a key component of that. I'm a component of that, others are. And then we have multiple different kinds of imaging tests that we may need to employ, all of which can be done here, and we have high-level expertise doing that as well. Some of those would be the heart ultrasounds, some of those are the ultrasounds down the throat, CAT scans, MRIs, these sorts of things um, that allow us to really get a good sense of what is it, are, what are the unique ways that we need to deal with a valve condition for a given person? Because every person has their own unique story and situation, and we need to tailor and figure out what are the right steps for this person? What are the options? Because we have a lot of options for dealing with these things at this point. So just in general, what options are we talking about here? I, can I take medicines or, or exercise more? Or how, how do we deal with this, right? And as it turns out, valve problems are a mechanical problem, and therefore they require a mechanical solution. Medicines don't work. Um, Increasing our diet and exercise don't really have a lot of impact. What we need to do is we need to fix the mechanical issue. And there's two broad ways that we might want to think about that. Number one, there are surgical, sorry, 
surgical treatment options here. And Dr. Malloy is, I think, going to speak at length about that. And this has been kind of a long-standing way that we treat valve troubles. And we might even think, when we think surgery, we might think automatically towards, you know, kind of going down the middle in the chest wall and really doing major, major surgery. Um, but there's been a lot of evolution and, in, in, in point of fact, amazing things that can be done from minimally invasive approaches. Um, and Dr. Malloy is going to speak at length about that. And then in the more recent time frame, uh, within the last 10 plus years, 10 years, maybe less than that, depending on what we're talking about, there are now what we call catheter-based treatments. We also use the word percutaneous, meaning inside of the body through the veins and the arteries. And what you can do is you can start to manipulate the anatomy of our valve trouble um, just by dealing with things through the veins. And that might be replacing a valve. That might be kind of cinching it together a little bit. Um, the wide variety of options, and we'll kind of talk about those a little bit as well. Um, but those are sort of the brief overviews there. So I think at this point, any questions on just general ideas of valve troubles? Any, any thoughts? I know, you all want to hear Dr. Malloy. It's like, <laughs> I get it, I get it. <laughs> yes, sir, how can I help you? Yeah, gosh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things that can cause chest discomfort. Um, and I think what we would start off with is just chatting with someone about those symptoms and getting a sense of what that story is kind of making us think about. And we would initiate some diagnostic tests like an EKG. We would probably do a blood test looking for heart enzyme levels that give us a sense of if the heart's being injured. And maybe we'll do some other types of blood tests that give us a sense of other problems that could be contributing. Um, there are also many other kinds of imaging tests that could inform us as to the problem. So it's sort of a broad question, unfortunately. Is that helpful? <laughs> Does that answer your question? Well, not really. Uh, okay. Um, my, uh, so talking specifically about blood lipid profiles, which is, uh, that, that's my, my, my basic philosophy about that is, um, uh, you kind of got to back into the problem, okay? Uh, I have done this a long time, and I've seen folks um, who have the best cholesterol blood test you've ever, ever seen. And they've done all the right things, too. They've eaten the right diet, and they've not smoked, and don't only start to, and yet they have pretty bad blocked arteries because every person in their family had them at 50 years old, you know? And I've seen the reverse of that, where the blood tests, uh, you know, are, are terrible, and they smoke, and this, that, and the other, and they don't have any artery troubles. So blood tests are, you got to take them with a grain of salt. What you really want to know is, are there b cholesterol blockages and buildups in the arteries? Um, and if that's true, then you can start thinking about the blood tests with a certain level of, of uh, you know, kind of putting that in the right context, if you will. Does the particle number help me much? Not really, to be honest with you. I, I think as far as you, I'm concerned, if you've got blocked arteries, you need to be on cholesterol medication that impacts the cholesterol. Does that answer your question? No, I personally don't prescribe niacin. Great. Yes, may I help you, ma'am? Yeah. Um, what effect does this have on um, uh, blood pressure? Does it seem to tell by the what's going on with your blood pressure? Whether it's valid or not? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, blood pressure is a very interesting thing because it's kind of the end result of this finely tuned mechanism of the heart pumping blood to the body and the blood kind of accepting it, you know? And, um, and, and the body is really interesting because when it's under stress or things aren't quite working correctly, it starts to compensate and do whatever it can to make things as normal as possible. And it'll start to try to impact things like the blood pressure in a way to make up for the heart not doing so well. So yes, the blood pressure can be impacted. Probably the way that I see most that it's impacted is that the blood pressure may go really high, depending on the circumstance, or really low. Or that, as you know, you probably, if any of you um, take your blood pressure at home, there's a top number and a bottom number. 
And another thing that we tend to see is that the difference between the two becomes really large or really small. Um, so like it could be like, let's say 160 over 40, you know, that's a really big difference. Or 120 over 95, that's a small difference. And I can't say specifically which one happens because it depends on the valve problem. You know, some valve problems, like really leaky heart valves, tend to have the very wide difference and their blood pressures tend to be lower, whereas the really narrowed heart valves tend to have the higher blood pressures even more. So it's a bit different, but you're right, blood pressure can be a clue. Yeah. Any other questions? I didn't, okay. So, um, Dr. Malloy, I would love to have you chat more about what, what else we do. Here it is, that's it. so it's the, uh, just the right click there, and then that's the pointer. Okay. Yeah, great. See if I can figure this out. I had to struggle with PowerPoint here because I'm a keynote guy, and they tried to convert all my slides to PowerPoint. It was very traumatic for me. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, treatment of valve disease, um, and there's been a lot of change in the treatment of valve disease since I was a resident. Um, I want to go back to the, let's see, I guess I can use these buttons here. Um, we're going to talk first about the treatment of mitral valve disease. We, ha we have a, a recent patient in the audience, Professor Triker, who's up, up in the front, who had mitral valve disease and is, is now cured from his mitral valve disease. So, and he'll, he's going to answer some questions about his uh, experience and his recovery. The, the kind of mitral valve disease that he had was a, a complicated d disease involving bileaflet prolapse rather than the rather than the the types of disease that we see here which are which are simpler disease and actually more more common he had uh, he had myxomatous valve disease which is more complicated to to repair um, but some of the same fundamental principles of repair apply we're actually going to show uh, some of his operation with <coughs> if he if he uh, if he allows us to do that um, in any event we have the you know, the the valve can leak because the annulus is dilated where these leaflets a attach to the ventricle it can leak because something happens with the length of these cords that attach the leaflets to the ventricle and uh, it it can leak because the leaflets get pulled down by a a failing ventricle, and a lot of valves leak for a combination of those reasons. And uh, Dr. Carpentier in the 70s uh, developed techniques of repair that, that we still use uh, today in, in many cases, where we, we, we remove the unsupported segment and put the leaflet back together, the various different ways of doing that. A, m a more recent uh, so-called American correction as opposed to the French correction was to re replace damaged leaflets, uh, damaged cords with Gore-Tex cords and you'll see some of that in, <coughs> in the video. Um, when I trained we did all of our operations with a sternotomy incision. Um, then uh, about 15 years ago I started doing lateral thoracotomy uh, approaches to the mitral valve and then the last decade transition to primarily robotic approaches with, with port access approach as the most accurate way to get a good valve repair with the least, uh, with the least invasiveness to the patient. So it's really more about getting a good repair than less invasiveness, but uh, it does also reduce complications and length of stay in the hospital. With the aortic valve, we've gone to a small anterior thoracotomy and uh, um, we have, uh, we have Mr. Larry Smith in the audience who had that procedure done recently. Um, and he may uh, share some of his experience with us. Um, Heart-lung machine was developed in the 50s. Um, and the, the really the first cardiac operations of any uh, number were performed in the, in the 60s when they developed valve surgery in the 70s when coronary bypass surgery developed. So amazing that coronary bypass surgery has only been around since the late 70s. A lot of us uh, were here for a while before coronary bypass grafting was invented. Um, and uh, the, the operation, 
the classic cardiac surgical operation involves central cannulation to drain the blood out of the heart, to take it to an oxygenator, return it to the aorta where, uh, where the oxygenated blood uh, provides uh, necessary uh, support to the body while the heart is rendered motionless and empty of blood so, we, so that you can operate on it. Difficult to operate on a, a, a moving blood-filled uh, structure. Um, in the 90s, the uh, less invasive techniques were developed and one of the key factors involved was a, were the development of peripheral cannulation and ways to arrest the heart peripherally with catheters introduced through the groin. It didn't, do it so you could avoid these big sternal incisions. <coughs> so for the last decade, uh, at, I'd say a small group of surgeons in the country have focused on doing a number of uh, procedures with the Da Vinci robot. Um, the, the, the robot uh, involves um, a console that is separate from the operating instruments and separate from the operating table. So the surgeon is at a, is at a console looking anywhere from 3 to 15 X at the operating field through a three-dimensional camera moving these instruments that are introduced at the table side by another assistant uh, in, a, in a way that's considered intuitive because it's kind of like working with your hands. Um, and so that's why it was called the intuitive robot. And I, I show this slide because uh, that's, a, that's, that's me a couple of years ago. <laughs> and this is our internship group and this guy, Fred Mall. Uh, he was the first one to wash out of our pyramid group. In general surgery, you know, you had you start with a, you start with ten guys, and then three, two or three would finish. So Fred was the first guy out. I mean, he could barely tie his shoes. Um, so he didn't go beyond his internship, but he did develop the Da Vinci robot. And so this is 30 years later, and you can see my date. This we just finished an aortic dissection. It's about one in the morning, and this is Fred. With his, <laughs> with his date. So he invented the robot and it lived happily ever after. Um, so this is, uh, this is Professor Triker's uh, uh, surface echo. And I think, um, I think that uh, Dr. Carr can comment on this. Yeah, I'll just make some quick comments here. Um, <clears throat> so this is Dr. Triker again. Just to orient ourselves, we tend to look at the heart from a particular point of view. This is the left side of the heart, and that's the right side of the heart. These are the bottom chamber or main pumping chambers, and these <coughs> are the uh, top chambers called the atria. You have the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve here. And what I want you to notice is that um, other than the youthfulness of Dr. Trigger's heart, uh, <laughs> what you can see is, is that this valve, again, with the image in mind before of the very thin sort of beautiful lids, but these are much, much more thick than they should be, number one. And number two, at the end when the pumping, you can see them kind of bow backwards significantly, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and, and again, I think that, in, in Dr. Trigger and I even had this conversation, they're almost like rubber bands being stretched too far. And then if you go to the next one, this color that you see here represents blood flow. It's actually measuring the blood cells moving. And you might imagine you shouldn't see any of this going backwards. And this is a lot going backwards. This is all of his blood leaking through this valve that comes together and then can't hold on to this watertight seal. And all of this blood leaks backwards. And as a result, the chambers are enlarged of his heart a bit and, um, and it causes you know, the, the dysfunction. Professor Tracker's had a heart murmur for what, at least 15 years, many years. But 10 years ago, he was moderate regurgitation, and he, he over the years, progressed to severe regurgitation. I think uh, uh, Dr. Carr showed you the slide of where you are when you reach severe regurgitation. If you look, uh, if you're asymptomatic, which he, he was, uh, he, had, he had no symptoms. He's running marathons. He runs 50 marathons, is that right? Still running marathons at 78? 
79, still running marathons. Um, so, but the, the, the data from the Mayo Clinic slide that, that uh, you just saw shows that once you develop severe insufficiency, w within five years, 70% of patients are either dead or they have congestive heart failure or at the very least have atrial fibrillation. They, they have developed a serious problem. With what do you develop? What's that? You develop something? You, you, the, once you, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, once you, once you reach the severe stage, then even if you're asymptomatic, you're, you're kind of at the edge of the cliff. You're, things are gonna start going, going sideways. We're gonna talk about aortic valve in, in a little bit with a different patient. Once that patient became symptomatic, um, the cliff is even steeper. With, within, within three years, uh, you know, the average survival is two years. The average survival is, with the aortic valve, the cliff is steeper uh, than it is with the mitral, with the mitral valve. So, uh, moving on to, to uh, this video, this is, this is Professor uh, Triker's uh, procedure that was done, I think, December 29th, somewhere in there. And you can see, you know, believe it or not, those are very pink lungs for a 79-year-old. Typically, the lung is, uh, is black by the time you get to 79. So, you know, I think, I don't know where, I'm not sure where he lived, but it's probably reasonably clean air and not a smoker. Um, okay, so th this is the, we're opening the pericardium here. Uh, that's, that's the lining around the lung. This is the pericardium. We put, we put our, we put, we put three ports in. We've got a left and a right arm. We've got a working port. We got a camera port. They're all about they're all about eight millimeters, um, and the uh, that is a, that's a cautery scissor, and we're going to open up the pericardium, and we've already gone on bypass right now. So the if the atrium is collapsed. Um, professor's atrium is quite large because he's uh, an endurance athlete, but you don't see it now because we're on the heart lung machine. Um, and as we extend this pericardiotomy up towards, towards the head, you see the aorta. The aorta is up here, and the heart's still beating because we haven't arrested the heart. Now we have that, we have the, that catheter that we put up from the groin. There's a balloon inflated in, in your aorta right here. And this, this <coughs> excuse me. Should have one of those little guys here. Um, so uh, we've inflated the catheters we put up the groin to put them on heart lung machine and stop the heart. One of those has a balloon at the end of it. We've inflated that balloon. It's called an endo balloon, uh, and it, we put a solution in the root of the aorta to arrest the heart, so the heart stops beating. You see, his EKG is down here, and can't see it very clearly here, but um, his, his EKG is going, to, is going to go from a normal sinus rhythm to flatline. Um, if you look at his EKG strip here, and the atrium is still moving a little bit. The ventricle has, uh, is not moving much. Here's the transesophageal echo, which also helps us monitor the activity of the heart and the position of that balloon. Position of the balloon is very critical if the balloon moves covers up the vessels to the brain, then you, ha you have a problem. So here is, this is the robot has opened up his atrium and now we're over sewing the appendage. And the, the appendage is, a, is, a, is, a, is where 95% of the clot in the left atrium develops in patients who have dysrhythmias. So we, we over sew it to prevent stroke. Um, and, uh, Patients with mitral valve disease often develop atrial fibrillation at some point in their life and, it, and, and even perioperatively. So uh, we, we oversow that in, in uh, virtually every case now. And then the, uh, this, what you see at the top here, is a dynamic retractor. It's one comes through one of the arms, and we can move that around to expose any part of the heart that, that we want. It's one of the major advantages of the robotic uh, 
uh, equipment is that you get much better exposure than with the, the approach that we that we used in the past. The, the, those, uh, my table side is the one who's tying the knots out here. Now we're assessing this valve. And this is a papillary muscle. These are prolapsing. That's P1 and P2 of the posterior leaflet. It's a portion of the posterior leaflet. And it is, it, these cords are way too long. And, and there's, there's a cleft between, between those two that we would like to eliminate. They're, they're, they, they're, they should be together and they're separated. So we're going to put those, that cleft together and reduce the height of both of those leaflets with a Gore-Tex cord, with a pair of Gore-Tex cords. The anterior leaflet is also too long there. Um, we test this thing, we, we blow it up with, with saline and you, know, you look at that thing and you kind of go, yikes, how are we going to fix this because it's just kind of leaking everywhere. Um, it, and uh, it's not straightforward like s I could show you some videos of a, of a much simpler leak, but he's got billowing tissue there and we're going to put this together with, with that, with that uh, segment of the posterior leaflet and uh, reduce the height of it with, with this cord that we're putting in that's attached to the papillary muscle down there. My table side now is, is, is tying this knot from the outside. Um, and all these, all these uh, cords, you know, you, you, you think, gosh, I have to adjust every cord in there. Or, I mean, how can you possibly make this thing not leak if you don't take all those cords out and, and change all of them? It, as, it, as it turns out, if you, if you get the, the strength of the repair is not based on the, on the cords. It's lining up the closing, the closing mechanism so that the leaflets compress against each other. It's the Roman arch. They, so if you just line those leaflets up so that they, the problem is they're not aligned properly. They're, they're, they're co-opting way back in the atrium uh, rather than down closer in the ventricle. And so th there is a lot of pressure on those cords. So the, the idea is to, uh, reduce the coaptation point uh, into the ventricle and we also do that with a ring that we put in. The ring uh, that resizes the, you'll see that resizes the annular dimension um, will move that coaptation plane down into the ventricle. Now, Unfortunately this is not the simplest repair for the, a lay audience to understand. I could, I have some other very s much simpler repairs and this here we've adjusted, we've blown up the, the ventricle with saline to adjust that anterior cord. We, we did several of those. Um, and now we're, we're closing up, we're closing up the uh, ventricle. I think that the, I got short sheeted on the, uh, on the, on this ring that we, 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 uh, we sized this to put in This is, this is the ring suture that we're putting in. We've already sized it somewhere back here. That was a brief shot of the sizing the ring. And we, he, <coughs> he had the size of his anterior leaflet was about a 32. So that's the size ring that he has in there, which is a, which is a, which is a large annulus, um, which is good for an aerobic athlete. He wants to, you don't want to make his valve small because he's got to put a lot of blood flow through there when he's running his next marathon. Um, a, a, a someone his size, typical annular size, might be more like 28, um, but his is, is somewhat larger. So here it shows us closing the ventricle. The ring is in place here. Uh, it's been secured with a titanium uh, crimping device and um, we'll come next to the post-operative result, perhaps. So I think we'll have Dr. Carr comment on the post-operative transesophagy. Uh, this is a surface echo. Yeah. So uh, this will play here. I'm sure maybe we hit the button there. 
So what's really important to make note of is, first of all, the, the uh, size of the valve has been shrunk down a bit. And then Dr. Malloy has, um, these two bright areas right here are this ring, which really is sort of like a, uh, a girdle, if you will. It kind of supports the overall structure of the valve. And he's created a little bit of what we call this toilet bowl mechanism where um, you can see it sort of largely moving up on the top and then it comes together and it, uh, it uh, kind of toilet bowl uh, collapsed over to this other side. And the end result is on the next slide here. A toilet bowl I analogy I have not heard. <laughs> but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I approve of that. <laughs> it's, it works. I don't know. It works. <laughs> and then, but what's important is, is that it's not leaking anymore. There's no more blood going the wrong direction. Um, and that's pretty obvious because of Dr. Malloy's excellent work. So. This is a simpler mechanism of regurgitation. It's one simple segment that prolapses in one jet of regurgitation. Uh, and here we see another view of it. That's a, that's simple P2 prolapse, much much more straightforward and actually more reproducible to repair and more common. Um, I think we're going to move on to uh, aortic uh, valve disease. Uh, we have Larry Smith here, and he had a, a, a calcific aortic stenosis that looked very much like pointer's not here. Okay, looked very much like this valve in the center heavily calcified, those, those leaflets did not open, and we're going to show his echo here in a minute. Now, wh why, why, why this? Why all this calcium in here? What's, what's the deal there? Why does, it, why, do the, why does the calcium leave your bones and go to your arteries and your valves? That's for Dr. Carr, because I don't know the answer to that. And if we solve that problem, we can all go home, because it's very common. The, the, the calcium le leaves your bones, you get osteo osteoporotic, and you get coronary disease and stenotic valves. Um, so this is uh, Larry's uh, echo, and this is pretty dramatic. Yeah, so again, remember the, the normal structure where it would be the thin leaflets that open up quite beautifully, and so much so to where you would see them completely open here. The really bright aspect of the valve is the calcium, all this calcium and it's calcium extending down into this area, and the valve does not visually open at all. And what it really is, and this is in short axis here, and you can again remember the valve almost looks like a Mercedes-Benz sign, right, where it kind of opens up beautifully and comes back together. And the uh -huh. only blood that's going through is this little pinhole in the center where it's really struggling to get. It's not opening well at all. So Larry, a very active man, a marine, uh, and he'd had, been, he'd had a murmur for what, at least 10 years? Plus. Asymptomatic. Uh, and then about the last six to 12 months, chest pain, uh, shortness of breath with activity. And he, he's re reached that inflection point where he's just about to fall off a cliff. Uh, so uh, that's when he came to us. And so one of the things we do, and this is actually not his uh, CT, but we do CTs on everybody. It helps us determine where to make the mini incision. If you're doing a sternotomy, it's pretty simple. You just go in and just split the whole thing open, and you don't, you don't have to worry about where the heart is because it's in there somewhere. <laughs> but when we make a little incision like that, we got to be right in the right spot so we, where we can see the aorta and we can see the valve. Um, this is a particularly favorable one for a mini valve because the, the heart is off into the right chest, and it makes it very, very simple, that, uh, relatively easier to do this minimally invasive procedure. Um, uh, we cut the valve out. We make it, we open the, people ask me, do you go through, the, how do you get there? Do you, they think, most people think we cut up, cut the heart open. We don't, we cut the aorta open. It, it, it's much easier to sew the aorta than the ventricle. Uh, and we, we cut out that, uh, that valve and decalcify it. We put sutures around the annulus, then we put the sutures through the sewing ring of the valve. We drop the valve in and tie the knots in one, one fashion or another. Um, we have various types of valves. We, we used to put in more mechanical valves than tissue valves. Uh, mechanical valves, you, you need to be anticoagulated. The advantage is they last potentially forever. Bioprosthetic valves have become much more common. They, they, uh, they, they don't last forever, uh, but you don't have to take a blood thinner. 
Um, and blood thinner has uh, quality of life issues uh, and, and also the risk of bleeding. Uh, we have stentless valves. Uh, we have also uh, sutureless valves. And this is actually the valve that, that Larry had implanted. And this is a somewhat newer valve. It's been used in Europe for about 12 years. It's been used in the US for about two years. We've been using it for two years uh, in, in some of our patients. It's, it's considered particularly uh, appropriate in Europe for, for younger patients because uh, it, it's, uh, it leaves a very large uh, annulus to implant a future TAVR valve. So in other words, if these valves, if you live long enough, they're probably going to need to be replaced. They're going to, we think they get slowly rejected. And in a young person, age 40, they may only last three to five years. And someone who's 65 or older, they typically are going to last 15 years. Uh, but Larry's going to last 25 to 30 years. So he may need to have something else done in the future. Um, and we, we, we plan ahead for that. So here, here's his valve, uh, his Percival valve after a uh, valve replacement. Just keep, in, just kind of keep in note, again, this is the short axis version, so we're seeing it kind of right on end looking at it. And if you remember what those valves looked like, they had this sort of anchor ring around it, and these little struts that tend to kind of anchor, they point out right at you. So you can see that, these different areas of anchors. And then in the middle are these very thin, beautiful leaflets that are opening up We, we also do replacements that involve replacing the ascending aorta, particularly in patients, patients with bicuspid valve disease, which is, which is a, f a fairly common cause of aortic uh, stenosis and aortic valve disease. Um, we, we also want to uh, mention other, other treatments that uh, we offer, which include percutaneous valve replacements. The, 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 these valves are primarily used in patients that are not good surgical risk because their durability is, uh, uh, is, is really, I would say, unproven. They're, they're, fairly, they're fairly new valves. They've only been in, in, implanted in high-risk patients that, uh, that generally don't live long enough to find out the durability of the valve. Um, but the, <coughs> the future will include uh, more and more of these percutaneous valves, particularly in in elderly patients, and this is an example of the, the two most common valves on the market at the present time. Uh, and another slide that shows future uh, mitral valves and a short video of a uh, TAVR valve being expanded in the aortic annulus. Um, Advantages of these procedures are a shorter hospital stay, although our average hospital stay for a TAVR valve is, uh, is only about a day longer than the stay for a percutaneous valve, and you get a, a proven uh, valve. So this shows some of our results with minimally invasive valve replacement compared, compared to the average. The average is the, S the Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, accumulates data on now over 95% of all open heart surgeries performed in the United States. And the average amount of time uh, on the ventilator uh, at Adventist Hospital is two and a half hours. If you go you know, most any place else, you can see you're going to be on the ventilator in the range of 16 hours. And that, and that does not in, account for the 76, 60 to 70, 80% of patients that we actually extubate in the operating room. Um, so the, the, the intubation time for, the, the average intubation time shown in the previous slide, if it included our extubated in the OR patients, would be about a third as long as that. So it doesn't include those patients. And you can see that the rest of the country, I mean, if you have a sternotomy, you know, about 2% get extubated in the operating room. It's, it's a bigger deal. And blood, blood product usage is a lot less. This is the average in the, in, the, in the operating room. In 2017, we didn't use any. Uh, we don't have complete, the complete data is not back from 18 yet. But uh, 
we had no blood product usage in the operating room last year as well. This shows post-operative blood product usage. And again, very little blood products used here. And so if you, if you look at the STS average, over half the patients that get an aortic valve replacement get transfused in the United States today. And we're down around 4%. Um, so what's, what's, what's bad about getting blood? Well, lots of things. It's like getting a, it's like getting a, heart, it's like getting a transplant without immunosuppression. It, 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 it stirs up a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of processes that are destructive to the body, inflammatory processes, and it increases your risk of mortality with surgery. So we try very hard to not give blood. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's reflected uh, in our good outcomes, in our short length of stay, you know, four days versus seven days. Um, it's ref I think it's reflected in our in our mortality rate com compared to the rest of the country. Um, moving on to robotic re uh, repair, we we do the majority of our isolated mitral valves with the robot. In the country, it's it's a growing trend. I seem to be hitting the wrong button all the time here. Um, it's it's a it's a it's an increasing trend now. Now in, in 2017, it was up to 11.9 percent. I think you're going to see more and more less invasive surgery done and robotic surgery done uh, in the country. Um, but again, look, these are our, these are our ventilator times. At the time you're on uh, artificial support on a respirator, got a tube in your throat, uh, and you're sedated, and you're not recovering. Uh, and you're not up walking and recovering. So our average time is 0.5 hours and doesn't include the, the majority of patients that are, aren't even intubated at all. They come, to, they come to the ICU extubated. And once again, uh, you know, we don't use blood as opposed to other centers in the country. Length of stay is much shorter. Uh, in hospital mortality is is uh, is there, so I think that with the kind of multidisciplinary teamwork that we've been talking about, you know, as Chad said, we we spend hours every week looking at looking at echoes, trying to figure out how you know how how to fix this valve safely, or whether whether we should fix it, you know, uh, and or whether we should replace it, and we constantly look at our STS data and our uh, m measures of uh, of how we do things, uh, which, which th th those are what we what I showed you were were uh, our our uh, n not our process outcomes, but our uh, our actual process outcomes are are measures of how we do things. So we look at those to try to improve our overall outcomes, and we use minimally invasive technology. Uh, to a very large degree with our patients. And we have a universal bed unit. It's the only one in the city. In other words, you have open heart surgery here. You're not moved around to five different locations in the hospital. You have, the, you have a dedicated team of, of, uh, of uh, staff and nurses that understand an EKG. They understand uh, cardiac problems. They may not know too much about, uh, you know, uh, knee injuries, but they know everything about the heart, and that's that's who you want taking care of you, um, and that that makes that makes a difference in terms of length of stay, safety, and and your recovery. And we're, we have the only dedicated unit in the city. Every new unit that's built in the country now is is a, is a universal bed unit. So, uh, you know, I I suspect that someday there'll be another universal bed unit in Portland, but there's there's none now. We limit blood transfusions, as you can see, and I think that makes a big difference in patients' outcomes. And we follow our our patients uh, closely with our with our cardiology colleagues. So uh, I think I'd like to. I've chewed up too much time here, uh, but I would like to uh, invite questions to our. Uh, for, to our patients, um, maybe uh, we could have Mr. Smith come up and tell us about his uh, his recovery from aortic valve surgery. And uh, if any anybody has any questions for him, uh, why don't you come on up? Yeah. Can you replace a mitral valve with the cavern 
Testing? Yes. It, it, yes, but I showed a couple of examples of that there are on the market now and in, and in development no less than about 12 of them. It probably means that none of them work very well. Now, usually when something works well, there's only a few of them, you know, when you've got, but the, the, it's, it's, uh, it, it is progressing. Uh, and I think that, I think it will be a reality. Correct. Yes. Usually mitral is a longer procedure. Um, Larry, look, he looks good, huh? <laughs> How many days were you in the hospital? I, I, I don't recall. I think it was... So... Uh, yeah, in the, you know, in the partner trial, the average length of stay was four days. So that's a, that was a, that was in partner two. It was four days. So we, we're just about the same. I'm talking about a trial of TAVR valves, uh, and uh, we certainly think TAVR valves have a place for treatment of aortic valve disease. But typically, TAVR is compared to a, st st a sternotomy, not to minimally invasive aortic valve replacement. And uh, uh, we get lots of patients that have been evaluated for TAVR and come here for uh, minimally invasive valve replacement. Okay, anyhow, my name is Laurie Smith. Um, I'm 69 years old, 70 and... Larry Smith, uh, I'm 69 years old, to be 70 in June. And uh, this all started with my uh, uh, heart murmur it was probably about 15 years ago it was first diagnosed and okay, I said, okay, well, it didn't realize really what a heart murmur was, except for it just slowed me down a little bit, but not much. And then about, uh, I guess it was almost a month ago, um, we had been doing a lot of traveling and everything and having to get a lot of exercise and we normally hit the mall early in the mornings and, and make our five laps, which is a couple miles a day, just walking. But when we got back, uh, I, I was walking and, and I kept getting these little pangs in my chest, but I thought it was, you know, being in the Marine Corps, you just kind of work through it. And I did, and everything was fine. And I, so I really thought I was just out of shape. And then one day we went walking and we hadn't even walked a third of a mile and I actually had to stop and that's when I had to tell her uh, I had chest pain. Well, anyhow, that afternoon I went to see my primary doctor and luckily I had just seen him a couple weeks earlier because he heard the valve and he said we need to get you back over and have that tested again. Well, in the meantime, Dr. Daly was waiting for me to come back to give me the prognosis on that. and. Uh, so before I knew it, I think within about a four-week period, my mechanic here uh, was explaining how things were going to go and what was going to happen. So it was a fast process. My wife had asked him one time, well, if we didn't do this, what's the side trip? And he said, uh, sudden death. That kind of got our attention. So we went ahead and, and did it. and. I'm glad that uh, I didn't have the zipper. I had the less intrusive. And he says, yeah, we're gonna go from this side. I go, wait, my heart's over here. Yeah, but it's leaning this way. Oh, okay, so I learned something there too. But in the process of it, um, I woke up and I had stuff coming out everywhere. But it, as I went through, I realized what everything was for and understood why and I had the aortic here, I had things coming out of it, and uh, anyhow. Within uh, two days, I pretty much had it all done. He said, we'll keep you one more day just for final of observation. So in three days, I was out, and uh, I had followed another gentleman for the pre-surgery check-in and everything, and he had his done the day before, but he was still there when I left, but he had the full, full Monty, so 
I, I felt per pardon. I had the aortic valve replaced, and it was all it was covered with um, calcium. calcium. And I kept thinking, boy, I've been not taking care of myself, and but they found that the rest of my heart and valves, everything was was good, and it was no disease or anything. It was just the calcium built up on it, and so. I was happy to have that. Yes? We did it on January the 22nd. So today was my first day to hit the mall, and we normally make five laps, and I did three today just not to push it. Tomorrow I'll go back. <laughs> Question? Yes? Are you on any special diet? I'm married to my wife. I'm always on a diet. <laughs> but no, uh, the main thing is uh, right now it's super low sodium. That's the main thing. Um, anything else? No. The low sodium right now, I can pick it up a little bit later, but I'm getting so I don't need that much anyhow. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a type 2 diabetic and have been for 20 years, something like that. And... Uh, Yes. Are you a vegetarian or vegan? Oh no. No, I gotta I gotta have my meat. So lean. Lean, but yeah. She she'll say, What do you want for breakfast? Eggs as long as there's some meat in there, okay. But uh yeah, it's just I mean I could go on forever about my mechanic and there and everything. Good bedside manner. I've had um knee replacements in this hospital, now the heart surgery in this hospital. She's had multiple surgeries in this hospital, and we'd come back here any other time, any time because the staff in every department we've been in is just phenomenal. They're, they're a can-do attitude. Question? How long will your valve last? Well, I'm told that the other one, the pig, would be about 10 years. I got the cow. And they're saying probably about 15 years. So I'm hoping a little bit longer if I behave myself. What about the valves that are man-made out of tissue? Well, they, they, are, they are homograph valves that are man-made by another human. They're transplanted valves. We use those in certain cases. Uh, but they are synthetic. His, uh, his, his, uh, you know, the sudden death comment that, that I made to him, that, that, that can be a symptom of aortic stenosis. Mitral insufficiency that we'll get to next it tends to be more progressive uh, heart failure, you know, short, more and more, sh you know, short of breath, and that, you know, it's not as, it's not as precipitous as aortic valve disease. So, so I think we should have perhaps have have Professor Triker tell us a little bit about his uh, experience, and then, we'll, and then we'll we'll uh, we can take some more questions after uh, after. So, uh, do you want to tell us about uh, how you ended up here and and how your recovery went? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'd always lived a, li a lifetime of health. Uh, I, I survived the Second World War from being buried in the bombing. So I dedicated my life to being a healthy person. And um, so therefore I had very little in the way of any kind of involvement with, with medical stuff other than my annual medical. And then I was, I was um, informed that I had this heart murmur, uh, which was getting progressively worse. But uh, still running, I won a 10K race uh, about uh, two years ago. So still no, no symptoms or anything like that. And then I thought to myself, well, no way do I ever want to have my chest cracked open. I just couldn't, couldn't stomach that. I thought I'd even die before I have that. And so I did my research. I went online and did tons of research because uh, public health is my field. And I discovered, thank God, I f discovered Dr. Malloy and this hospital. So I thought I'm going to dig more deeply into this. So um, 
I made an appointment with him and, and sat down. And he has a very kind of a, a low-key, almost a laconic way of, of presenting to you. And I felt very reassured. And I said to my wife, I said, I think I've found the right man for me. Because I felt, I felt comfortable. I felt in my heart, this was in my heart, <laughs> that this, this is where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. So I committed myself to that. And then Dr. Malloy told me, he said, well, yes, he said, you could suddenly go over the cliff. Even though I'm still, still running um, and, and still feeling great, uh, you could go over the cliff. And I thought, listen to this man. I feel confident that, that I'm in the right hands. So I committed myself to his skill. And... Um, I was terrified. I've never been more terrified in my life. As I say, I went through the Second World War, was bombed, was buried, but this was the worst occasion of my life. I would wake up in the middle of the night sweating, thinking, someone's going to dig into my chest. I've never been dug into in my whole life before. And so my wife said, Ray, she said, and my daughter said, Ray, you've found the right man. Commit yourself to that. Let it go, because you're a control freak, you know? Don't be a control freak, let it go. So I, I did, and when I went to the hospital, and I found myself, Dr. Malloy came in and saw me just before, I found myself slipping into a, a state of incredible relaxation. Um, I'm not exactly a churchgoer, but if I got close to God, I think that's as close as I've ever been to the Almighty, because I felt in the hands of something really good. And I woke up following that, and I felt absolutely superb. It's almost as if I got drunk and I, and I was waking up from a, from a superb sleep. And um, so I had very little, I don't know exactly what the exact details of my recovery were, but I don't think I had very much in the way of pain medication. I was out in about a day and a half, and within one day I was out jogging. I was jogging again, and, and, and jogging along the road, feeling completely fine, and particularly thankful to, to be able to do this. And so now I'm, I'm back to almost my, my uh, normal level. I have a spirometer, which I can now suck out to, to maximum level. It's about 5,000 milliliters. I can suck it right out and almost break the thing. And, and um, whereas before, I, I couldn't. I, I could get to about 3,500, 3, but now I can go to the max. And so I, I, can't, I can't give you enough idea of the amount of pleasure I feel and the amount of gratitude I have for being alive, but also for finding Dr. Malloy, his staff, his, his support network, they were absolutely fantastic. I felt I felt in, in the lap of God. If there is a God, I certainly was right in the lap of God with this. And so I'm, I'm eternally grateful for everything that's happened to me, the experience of actually going through it, the trauma I had of going through it, wondering about whether I'd survive or not. I didn't want to die. Uh, and going through the experience has made me, I think, a more grateful, more humble person, even though I might not sound too humble right now, but I'm not humble because I'm grateful. Um, but um, the whole experience w was made that much more valuable, I think, by Dr. Malloy, his staff, and this wonderful hospital. I'm, I'm so grateful to, to have found it, and I'm glad I waited, because if I hadn't waited, I probably wouldn't have found you. So I'm so grateful. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. Well, <clears throat> certainly appreciate those nice words from our two patients. Um, you know, m more than more than any endeavor, w perhaps in medicine, minimally invasive uh, valve surgery is a team effort. You know, it's not a, it's not a one person uh, deal. I mean, uh, you know, uh, a conventional cardiac surgery, I, I you know, I can almost do by myself. But this stuff is a is a really a major team effort of uh, of, of everyone, the cardiologist, the uh, our office, the, the uh, ICU, it's a <coughs> it requ requires that everybody knows their job uh, to have to have good, safe outcomes. I mean, you you can get you can get by most of the time, uh, but if you you know if anybody if there's any loose links along the way, it's not, it's not gonna it's, you're gonna have some bad outcomes, and we don't have bad outcomes, so. We pride ourselves on that team approach. So uh, we probably should uh, we should probably uh, let let people go, and we'll be we'll be here to answer some questions for those that have more questions.
We appreciate your attendance. And uh, Jim, maybe you have some, some parting comments? Sure, well, thank you, you guys. You did a great job. I appreciate that.